Hey, do it, I'm Callan, and this is Slapped Ham. Today we're looking at some scary mysteries that have left historians baffled. So strap yourself in, hit that subscribe button, and get ready for more creepy content just like this. The format of the homepage for the website oct282011.com won't seem very odd to anyone who was using the internet in its earlier days. The page is relatively plain. It contains an all-black background and a few lines of white text linking to other pages. The text is cryptic and many believe that it might be a page for recruiting others into a cult. It was so concerning that authorities looked into the page but were unable to trace it. Many of the internet users who heard about the page were curious about the bizarre links that the page redirected to. It seemed to be filled with strange puzzles that other users were meant to crack. The site took users to crude drawings of pyramids and others appeared to be Schrodinger's cat. However, the most tempting part of the mystery was a phone number. For a while, it seemed like the courage of the internet failed. Despite being part of one of the most prevalent unsolved internet mysteries, no one reported calling the number. That is, until the date referenced in the site, October 28, 2011, came and went without incident. The website never changed, keeping the same mysteries it had always held. Disappointed by the anticlimactic turn of events, some followers of this mystery finally made calls to the phone number listed on the site. Their reports were terrifying. Many reported hearing a long silence followed by muffled voices or heavy breathing. At least one person claimed to have heard a heavy object being dragged across a floor. Some said that the things they heard were so disturbing that they couldn't bring themselves to repeat them. Eventually, the website disappeared from the internet without explanation. Some users believe that the government shut down the page, perhaps to protect the users from whatever horrifying things had been on the other end of the phone line. When people think of mysterious artifacts involving Jesus Christ, the first thing that often comes to mind is the Shroud of Turin. But Christian history tells of another miraculous artifact bearing the mark of Christ, the Linen Veil of Veronica. It's believed that the veil was worn by Veronica, a pious woman who was in the crowd on the fateful day that Christ carried his cross through the streets of Jerusalem on the way to Calvary. Taking pity on the exhausted man, Veronica used her veil to blot the blood and sweat from the face of Christ as he passed by with his burden. Christ was so thankful for her kindness that he left an impression of his image on Veronica's veil. She kept the veil until she realized that it had miraculous healing powers. She journeyed to Rome with the veil and placed it in the care of Pope Clement. In 1297, the veil was displayed in the Vatican Basilica. It became the object of much adoration by those who came to experience its healing powers and look upon the likeness of Christ. Eventually, the veil was stored in the Vatican archive, but it was still displayed every year for the faithful. Now it's thought that the real veil is actually not the one displayed by the Vatican, but is instead kept safely tucked away in a monastery. Just like the Shroud of Turin, the monastery veil has been subjected to numerous tests, and it's been determined that the image wasn't painted on the veil, but instead was infused in such a way that the image is identical on both sides of the linen. There's been a lot of debate surrounding Veronica's veil. Skeptics believe that it's a deliberate copy of the face of the Shroud of Turin. They also point out that the encounter between Christ and Veronica was never historically documented. Unfortunately, both veils are too delicate to submit them to carbon dating, leaving many wondering which veil is the real artifact. It doesn't seem to matter that there are two veils or that no one seems to know which one is the authentic one. Veronica has been named a saint, and thousands pray to her each year for healing and guidance. Specially blessed replicas of the veil can also be purchased from the church. The mystery of the veil continues even today. Located in Chatsworth, Georgia, Fort Mountain is part of the Kohata Mountains in the Appalachians. The mystery of Fort Mountain is the ancient rock wall located on the mountain. It's an impressive structure measuring 885 feet long with 29 pits, stone rings, cairns and the ruins of a gateway scattered along its path. In some areas, the wall is 7 feet tall and 12 feet thick, but the average height is 2 to 3 feet tall. But who built this mysterious wall? 
It was first thought that the wall was built as a fort by Hernando de Soto at around 1540, as a defense against the Creek Native Americans. But this theory was abandoned when it was pointed out that de Soto was only in the area for approximately two weeks. The most interesting and lasting theory actually comes from Cherokee natives. The Cherokees stated that the wall was built by a tribe of Moon-Eyed people. These individuals were called Moon-Eyed because they had pale grey eyes. They were also described as being smaller in stature than other native tribes, and they also had pale skin. Cherokee legends state that the tribe lived in the area before the Cherokee arrived in the late 1700s and drove them out. The Cherokee went on to say that not only did the Moon Eye people build the wall, they also built a temple inside the fort that included a large stone snake with ruby stone eyes. So who were the Moon Eye people? A popular theory suggests that they were actually of Welsh descent. It's thought that the Welsh prince Madoc Ob Owain Gwynedd left his homeland after his father passed away, due to upheaval among the surviving sons fighting over their father's land. Madoc set sail in 1170, and it's thought that he landed in the vicinity of Mobile Bay, Alabama. Madoc eventually returned home and gathered resources as well as followers before returning to the Alabama region on 10 ships. It was the last time he would ever be heard from in Wales. Some historians think that Madoc and his colonists built the fortifications on Fort Mountain, along with a similar fortification near DeSoto Falls, Alabama, which is said to be identical to the layout of Dolwidian Castle, Madoc's birthplace. All of this has led to the conclusion that the Moon-Eyed people were actually the descendants of Madoc and his people. Historians, geologists and archaeologists still wonder about the origin of the fortifications on Fort Mountain. Many feel that the structures had some sort of ceremonial significance, while others think that the wall and other structures were intended for defence. Ultimately, the answers lay buried in the past, but it's interesting to note that many strange occurrences have occurred on Fort Mountain including the sounds of phantom drum beats and the sighting of shadow figures that seem to be patrolling the ancient wall. It's thought that everyone has a double, a look-alike out in the world that looks and sounds just like their matching twin. But what if you were hounded by a spectral twin every day? To make it even more disturbing, what if you couldn't see your doppelganger but those around you could? That is exactly what happened to Emily Sagi. By all accounts, Emily Sagi, a French school teacher, was well liked. She was considered to be a good teacher, but during the mid 1800s, she was fired from 18 different teaching positions because of her strange affliction. In 1845, Sagi was hired by an elite girls' school in Riga, Latvia. It was while she was working here that the details of one of the most documented cases of the appearance of a doppelganger came to light. 13 students all witnessed the appearance of Sagi's double. As she was teaching, the doppelganger appeared nearby and mimicked all of her actions. Even stranger, while everyone else in the room was able to see the spectre, Sagi herself could not. The doppelganger didn't just limit itself to the classroom. The shade was spotted on the school grounds, sometimes near Sagi and sometimes trailing behind the class when they were strolling in the garden. Unfortunately, Sagi lost her job at this school as well. It's been speculated that Sagi may have been so devoted to her students that she subconsciously projected an additional self to help watch over them. Other theorists thought that the doppelganger was actually a malignant spirit, intent on tormenting the young teacher. This historical doppelganger case remains a mystery. The case of Travis Walton has been a source of controversy between ufologists, skeptics and law enforcement since it first became known to the public in 1975. On the night of November 5th, 1975, Travis Walton, along with the rest of the logging crew that he worked with, were on their way home when they saw an intense light just over the hill on the forest road they were on. As they drew near, the entire crew witnessed a strange disc hovering over the road and shining a light down on the ground below. Walton exited the truck to get a closer look, but decided after his initial approach that it wasn't such a good idea. Before he could return to the truck, he was knocked down to the ground, apparently by a greenish-blue light that had been issued from the disc. His fellow crew members left in a panic, but they soon returned to where Walton had fallen. They searched for him, but he was nowhere to be found. Travis Walton was missing and would remain so for almost a week. 
A massive search for Walton took place, but there was no sign of him anywhere. His co-workers came under suspicion, with the local police officers thinking that the loggers had killed Walton, either by accident or during an argument that had taken place earlier in the day. The logging crew was asked to take a polygraph test, and with the exception of one individual who refused to take it due to a criminal background, they all passed. Five days after he had disappeared, Travis Walton made a phone call from a nearby town. When he was picked up, he was disoriented and thought he had only been missing for a couple of hours. The story that he told was a fantastic one. Walton claimed to have been abducted by aliens. He also took a polygraph test and while he failed the first one, he passed the two additional tests that he later took. Travis Walton's alien abduction is one of the best documented and well-known cases in history. Like many of the most interesting unsolved internet mysteries, the story of Lake City Quiet Pills begins on Reddit. In 2009, a Reddit post was made reporting that a fellow user going by the name Religion of Peace had passed away. The user who wrote this memorial, 2-6, had made their account that day to inform the Reddit community of their friend's passing. While this seems like a simple story, it gets much more complicated. Users who had interacted with the deceased Redditor began looking through his post history to find bits of information about him. It seemed that he had a history with the military and loved to insult internet trolls. He also moderated a subreddit called Jailbait, a page for posting racy photos of young looking women. However, the most interesting thing that they found was only discovered through a lot of digging into both the deceased Redditor and the friend who memorialized him. Dedicated Redditors eventually found a link to the place where Religion of Peace worked, an image hosting site called LakeCityQuietPills.com. Some speculated based on the fact that user 2-6 had only created an account to inform the site of his friend's passing that the whole thing may have been a publicity stunt for the creepy website. Despite these speculations, many users began using the site for their own images to memorialize the fallen Redditor. Then, some of the more tech-savvy members of the Reddit community began noticing unusual things in the website's code. Bits of text that seemed to be hidden calls for hitmen. After further research, some Redditors discovered a factory called Lake City Ammunition Plant, giving a chilling new meaning to the quiet pills referenced in the website's title. Some users reported the information to local authorities, but no one knows what became of the investigation. This bizarre case began with user rbradbury1920 asking Reddit for legal advice in 2016. The user described a disturbing situation in which they found mysterious posted notes around their home, with handwriting on them that they couldn't recognize. The contents of the notes were fairly banal, typically reminders of tasks they should complete. One note said, Our landlord isn't letting me talk to you, but it's important we do. By this point, the user had set up a webcam to help solve the mystery, but discovered that the footage had been deleted and the computer's trash had been emptied. The user found no other signs of a break-in, but they were understandably disturbed and asked Reddit for help. One user who came across the post asked rbradbury1920 if they noticed having headaches recently. They pointed out that it seemed like rbradbury1920 had been writing the notes and forgetting about them. They stated that headaches and memory loss were possible signs of exposure to carbon monoxide. After reading this comment, R. Bradbury1920 put up a carbon monoxide detector and discovered dangerous amounts of CO in their home. They immediately sought medical attention and had the problem in their apartment addressed. Other users lauded the commenter for saving the poster's life, and the poster used Reddit's tipping system to send their saviour $10. The case of the cryptic posted notes is one of the few scary mysteries solved by Reddit that actually has a happy ending. In early December 1873, a very strange event took place in Bristol, England. On December 8th, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas B. Cumston travelled to Bristol for a brief vacation. They checked into a quaint hotel thinking they'd have a restful holiday. But what took place was a bizarre occurrence that frightened and confused them so much that they were arrested for disorderly conduct. 
Early that evening, the Cumstons heard unusual noises emanating from the vicinity of their room. They promptly reported the disturbance to the proprietor, who, while having heard the noises, didn't really think too much about it. Eventually, the Cumstons retired for the night, but they woke at around 3am when they once again heard the strange noises. As they leapt from the bed, the Cumstons discovered that not only had the disturbing sounds returned, but it also seemed as if the floor was eroding beneath them. Mrs. Cumston immediately cried out for help, but their voices had taken on a strange hollow quality that gave the impression that their shouts were being echoed by disembodied entities. As the floor opened up, Mr. Cumston found himself being pulled towards the chasm, only escaping when his wife pulled him to safety. The frightened couple exited through a window and ran away into the night, thinking that criminals had broken into their room intending to kidnap them. They made their way to a railway station where they caused such a stir that they were arrested for disorderly conduct. When they appeared in court, the proprietor of the hotel testified that while she had heard some unusual noises, she had not perceived them as any sort of threat. During the investigation, the police examined the couple's room but didn't find anything out of order. The court eventually decided that the Cumstons had suffered from a shared hallucination and they were allowed to go. No explanation has ever been given about what actually happened to the Cumstons. One theory involves the possibility of a portal opening up to a parallel universe. The mystery remains unsolved. Known as the most haunted house in Britain, Borley Rectory has a long history of tragedy and paranormal activity. It's believed that the rectory is haunted by the ghosts of a monk and a nun who lived in the area in the 1300s. Legends state that a Benedictine monastery once stood in the area, and that a monk that resided there had a relationship with a nun from a nearby convent. The affair was discovered and the monk was executed, and the nun was supposedly bricked up in the convent walls. The rectory was known for prolific poltergeist activity as well as ghostly sightings, cold spots, disembodied voices, and strange messages scrawled on the walls. While living in the rectory, Eric Smith and his wife contacted famous paranormal investigator Harry Price in the hopes of receiving some help with the ghostly activity in their home, sometime around 1928. Price conducted experiments and observed ghostly phenomena, but the Smiths moved out of the rectory in 1930, no longer willing to share their home with its ghostly inhabitants. Reverend Lionel Foister and his wife Mary Ann moved into the rectory in 1930 along with their daughter. The paranormal activity seemed to increase, with a particular focus on Mary Ann. Bells could be heard ringing, windows were broken, and Mary Ann was snatched from her bed. Cryptic messages were found written on the walls and seemed to be addressed to Mary Ann. The Foisters left the rectory in 1935, making it available once again for Harry Price, who rented it for one year. Price placed advertisements in the newspaper for individuals willing to take part in a year-long investigation of the property. He eventually wrote a book about the project called The Most Haunted House in England. Unfortunately, the rectory was destroyed by fire in 1939. The grounds are still considered to be a hotspot of paranormal activity, however, making it a go-to location for paranormal investigators. In November 1930, fur trapper Joe LaBelle headed for an Inuit village located on the shores of Lake Anjakuni in Canada, hoping for a warm and safe place to get out of the cold for the night. LaBelle was quite familiar with the little village, but what he found there that evening was rather disturbing. The village was normally a bustling hive of activity, but when LaBelle called out a greeting, the only response he heard was the echoes of his own voice dancing across the lake. LaBelle immediately sensed that something was terribly wrong. There was no smoke coming from the chimneys, no voices to be heard in the distance, not even the barking of the sled dogs that resided in the village. LaBelle checked all of the shacks in the village, expecting to find the villagers had packed their belongings and left. Instead, he found that food, weapons and personal belongings had all been abandoned. In some cases, LaBelle even found meals prepared but left uneaten, as well as half-finished chores that seemed as if they had been suddenly discarded. There was no sign of a struggle anywhere. Even though he was cold and tired, LaBelle exited the village and headed to a telegraph office located several miles away. He later admitted that the empty village frightened him and that he was concerned that he too would disappear as the villagers had. 
LaBelle sent an emergency message to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who immediately made their way to the village. Along the way, they stopped to chat with a local trapper, who informed them that he had recently seen an unusual gleaming object in the sky that seemed to be headed right for the Anjakuni village. Once they arrived at the village, the Mounties not only confirmed LaBelle's account, they made even more bizarre discoveries. Every tomb in the village burial ground had been opened and emptied, with the marker stones stacked in two orderly piles. Things continued to get more disturbing. The Mounties discovered the bodies of the village sled dogs dead of starvation. After an investigation, the Mounties came to the conclusion that the villagers had disappeared approximately eight weeks before LaBelle's arrival, based on berries found in a cook pot. Other than an approximate time of the disappearance, the Mounties weren't able to determine anything else, including where the villagers went. So what happened to the missing villagers? Several theories have been tossed around, including alien abduction, angry ghosts, curses, and even vampires. The Mounties have since discredited the story as a legend, but there are simply too many accounts about the events to simply dismiss it. Dancing can be a fun way to ease stress and get some exercise without really feeling like you're working out. But what if dancing ultimately leads to your death? That's exactly what happened to a group of individuals in what is now Strasbourg, formerly Alsace, in July 1518. It all started on a sunny day with one lone dancer. Frau Trophia began to dance with a great amount of exertion in a Strasbourg street. A week later, 34 individuals had joined Trophia in the street, all of them dancing. Within a month, approximately 400 people were dancing in the streets, most of them women. While specific numbers were never recorded, it's known that some people died during what became known as the Dancing Plague. Of heart attacks, exhaustion and strokes, others may have died from dehydration. Physicians were consulted and they diagnosed hot blood as the cause of the plague, and prescribed more dancing as a cure, with authorities going so far as to open guild halls and building a stage for the dancers. Musicians were even brought in to encourage more enthusiastic dancing. These actions only seemed to act as a contagion of sorts, and soon spectators were joining in with the plagued dancers. There are a variety of theories of what was behind the dancing plague. Food poisonings being considered or possibly ergot ingestion, which could occur if the dancers ate grains contaminated with ergot fungi. Ergot toxicity causes erratic or bizarre behaviour in those who eat it and it's been attributed to the Salem witch trials as the source of the strange behaviour that resulted in the accusations made by those involved in the trials. The ergot theory was eventually dismissed, however, because it didn't explain how the dancers managed to carry on for as long as they did. Another popular theory was stress-induced mass hysteria. The people in that area of Strasbourg were dealing with disease and starvation, factors that could have led to abnormal behaviour. Ultimately, no one really knows what exactly caused the Dancing Plague of Strasbourg, but regardless of what caused it, everyone hopes that it doesn't reoccur ever again. In 2014, another cold case stuck out among the other scary mysteries that often end up being discussed on Reddit. A user called Zombie Grey took to the site to spread the word of a case that had long been fascinating her, the case of Grateful Doe. In 1994, a young student named Michael Eric Hager picked up a hitchhiker while travelling to his mother's house. The hitchhiker was wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt, and Hager's friends and family suspected that a shared love of music may have prompted Hager to pick up the stranger. At some point, Hager's Volkswagen van went off the road and crashed into a tree. Both men died instantly. While Hager was quickly identified by friends and family, the hitchhiker's identity remained a mystery. He carried no identifying items and the crash had made his face all but unrecognisable. The only clue was a cryptic note found in the man's pocket. The case eventually went cold until Zombie Grey revived it, hoping it could be solved by Reddit. They posted all available information about the case, including digital reconstructions of what Grateful Doe may have looked like before the crash. The case became wildly popular, attracting the attention of thousands of users. One user began commenting about the similarity between the photos and his former roommate, Jason Callahan. 
The user hadn't seen Callahan since 1995, but remembered that he had been a big fan of the Grateful Dead. The information eventually made its way to Callahan's grandmother, who hadn't seen him since he left to follow the Grateful Dead on tour in 1995. She filed a police report and authorities were able to use DNA testing to confirm that the body was in fact Callahan's. After 20 years, Grateful Doe finally had a name, all thanks to Reddit. The Bell Witch Haunting is one of the most infamous cases in haunted history. It's captured the imagination and curiosity of countless investigators, historians and even skeptics and it's still unexplained today. While the original farmhouse is no longer standing, a replica can be found on the property near the place where the original homestead once stood. The Bell Witch Cave, thought to be a portal between this world and the next, can also be visited by appointment, and paranormal investigators as well as tourists report activity even today. Paranormal activity was first noted on the Tennessee farm in 1817 when John Bell, the family patriarch, saw a strange dog-like creature on his property. He fired a shot at the creature but missed. This was the beginning of a full-scale psychic attack. Soon the Bell family was plagued with a wide variety of paranormal activity. Doors slammed, bedding was yanked off those who were sleeping, and family members were stuck with pins. Soon, a disembodied voice was heard claiming to be Kate Batts, a local woman that John Bell had once had a dispute with. Old Kate, as she was commonly known, had a particular hatred for John Bell. He was afflicted with strange symptoms that included the swelling of his tongue and throat, and the spirit went out of her way to humiliate him whenever she could. Old Kate also focused a good deal of negative attention on Betsy Bell. The young teen had her hair pulled and was slapped across the face by unseen hands. Unlike Betsy and John, Lucy Bell, Betsy's mother and wife to John, was a favourite of the Bell Witch. Old Kate materialised fruit and nuts for Lucy, and it was said that Lucy was even gifted a handful of straight pins. Eventually, the attention that John Bell received from the Bell Witch was his undoing. In 1820, he became seriously ill and eventually died. It was believed that the spirit poisoned him when a strange vial of black liquid was found by his bedside. A dose of the liquid was given to the family cat, which promptly died. After John Bell's death, the paranormal activity at the farm seemed to die off. Old Kate did put in a final appearance, however, stating that she would return to the descendants of the Bells in 100 years. The origin of the spirit remains a mystery even today. On December 9th, 1531, 57-year-old Juan Diego was on his way to church in Tenochtitlan, Mexico, when he suddenly heard music near Tepeyac Hill. At first, he thought it was a bird song, but before long, Diego wondered if he was actually hearing a heavenly chorus. Soon, the music faded away, and instead, Diego began to hear the voice of a woman calling his name from the top of Tepeyac Hill. Diego made his way to the top where he encountered a girl who in appearance seemed to be around 15 years old. She seemed to be giving off a glowing light that lit up the area, and she was dressed in an attractive red and gold gown and a star-studded turquoise cloak. While Diego stood gaping at the apparition, the girl told him that she was the Virgin Mary, mother of the true God who gives life. Mary went on to tell Juan Diego to build a church on the hill so that others could come and receive comfort and guidance. She then told Diego to pay a visit to Don Fray Juan de Zumarraga, the Bishop of Mexico, and tell him that the Virgin Mary wanted a church built. Juan Diego made his way to the bishop and, in time, was granted an audience. He relayed Mary's desire to have a church built to the bishop, but the bishop promptly shot him down, stating that he wasn't willing to consider such a project based on a whimsical vision. Diego headed home, feeling that he had failed. Along the way, he once again encountered Mary, and he told her of his encounter with the bishop. Once again, Mary instructed him to approach the bishop. Diego did as he was bid, but this time the bishop was more willing to hear Diego out. He told Diego to ask Mary for a miraculous sign to prove her identity. The bishop then sent two servants to follow Diego home and deliver a full report to him of what took place. The servants attempted to follow Diego, but they lost sight of him and had to report back to the bishop that they had failed at their task. While the servants were reporting their failure, Diego was once again approached by the vision of Mary. 
He explained that the bishop required a miraculous sign. Mary instructed Diego to return at dawn the next day to receive the sign. Unfortunately, Diego's uncle fell ill and he was unable to return to Mary at the appointed time. When he made his way back to Tepeyac Hill, not only did Mary forgive him, but she also healed his uncle. She then instructed Diego to go to the top of the hill and gather the flowers that grew there. Diego climbed the hill even though it was winter and there was a frost on the ground. He didn't expect to find any flowers, but surprisingly he found that roses were growing on the hill. He gathered the flowers into his tilma or poncho and took them back to the Virgin. Mary arranged the flowers into a pattern onto Diego's poncho and then helped him to put it on his back, tying the corners around his neck to hold the roses. She then sent Diego back to the bishop, telling him not to show the roses to anyone along the way. The bishop was shocked when Diego presented the roses. He had secretly prayed for a sign of roses and here they were, but even more stunning was the tilma itself. Where the roses had rested, there was now a beautiful image of the Virgin Mary imprinted on the poncho. The symbolism in the image was very specific, easily conveying a message of love to the natives of Mexico. The image was displayed in the local cathedral until Mary's church could be built. Over a period of seven years from the first time the image was displayed, it was estimated that approximately 8 million pagan Mexicans converted to Christianity. The image is still on display today at the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. So is the image a true miracle? Millions of people seem to think so. The cloak, which is made of cactus fibers, has shown no sign of disintegration, and it's been noted that the image of a bearded man can be seen in the right eye of the image of Mary, leading the devout to believe that it's a reflection of what she saw in 1531, Juan Diego on Tepeyac Hill. Unlike the previous scary mysteries on this list, the Box of Crazy is an original story that user named Tramstop Dan posted to Reddit in 2014. In the post, the user describes the contents of a wooden box that they found near a trash can. The contents ranged from the banal to the bizarre, and the user hoped that by documenting the contents, the creepy mystery could be solved by Reddit. Tramstop Dan clearly had a flair for the dramatic. He first posted pictures of some of the more mundane items in the box, such as maps and technical drawings. However, things start to get interesting when you scroll to the photos of a drawing suggesting that the artist saw something in Tampa, Florida in 1977 that changed him. The drawing appears to depict an alien abduction. From there, the drawings get even more bizarre. The artist begins to draw depictions of entities that appear to blend extraterrestrial and religious elements. There was also a handwritten note describing an alien invasion that had apparently been covered up by the government. Reddit users were fascinated by the drawings and accompanying notes. Many believed that the artist had, in fact, witnessed an alien visit, and these drawings were his attempt to document the encounter. Users pointed to the precise, almost mathematical skill of the drawings as proof that the man was of sound mind. However, another user, Flyboy Will, who was well versed in the Bible, provided another explanation. He stated that the artist was obsessed with living creatures depicted in Ezekiel 10 that are described as having four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. Others added on to the comments speculating that the artist might have been a schizophrenic, who obsessed over the idea of finding evidence of aliens in the Bible. Although there's no way to prove that this theory is accurate, the community has accepted the explanation and considers the case solved by Reddit. On November 8, 1878, a strange occurrence took place on the Ashmore Farm near Quincy, Illinois. 16-year-old Charles Ashmore grabbed a bucket and headed outside to fetch water from the nearby spring. The spring was only a short distance away, so when he didn't promptly return, his father Christian and sister Martha went out to search for Charles, fearing that he might have slipped and fallen in the snow. Once outside, Christian and Martha saw Charles's footprints in the newly fallen snow, leading from the house and across the backyard. His footprints only travelled approximately 75 yards, and then the track suddenly ended, with nothing but pristine snow beyond. It was as if Charles had been plucked up mid-step. Christian and Martha continued on to the spring. 
taking care not to disturb the tracks as they did so. When they reached the spring, they saw that the water had a film of ice, indicating that Charles had never even made it there. Four days later, Mrs. Ashmore went to the spring, where she said that she heard the voice of her son calling out to her when she crossed the area where his footprints had ended. This continued to occur for several months after the disappearance. The voice of Charles seemed to grow fainter as time passed, and though all of the family heard the voice, they couldn't make out what was being said. By the summer of 1879, the voice was no longer heard at all. There has been a lot of controversy surrounding this story. Some believe that it's a purely fictional story written by Ambrose Bierce. Others believe that Bierce based his story on a true account. It was known that Bierce was very intrigued by all things Fortean. He investigated an 1854 case of a man named Orion Williamson, who was said to have disappeared while walking across his property while at least two other people were watching. He was never found even though a large search party was incorporated. Just like Charles Ashmore, Williamson was periodically heard calling out for several months after his disappearance. It was theorized that Williamson had walked into a void spot of universal ether. Whatever the case may be, these two disappearances remain unsolved. In 2014, a Reddit user called ShadyBusiness15 took to the site hoping their own mystery could be solved by Reddit. The case quickly became one of the most legendary scary mysteries of the internet. According to the post, the user, a young student, had a scary moment when an extension cord in their room violently blew a fuse. While waiting for maintenance to come by, they decided to open up the power strip to see how bad the damage was. That's when they found something that seemed oddly out of place. The object appeared to be an old SIM card stamped with a serial number, something that wouldn't be typically found in an extension cord. The user went to Reddit to find out if anyone had a possible explanation for what the mysterious piece of electronic equipment could have been doing inside of the extension cord. The answers were shocking. According to more knowledgeable members of the Reddit community, the SIM card was clearly attached to a microphone, suggesting that the contraption was a recording device meant to spy on whatever was happening near the device and record the information. Although Reddit was unable to solve the mystery of what the object was, it opened up a larger question. What was it doing there? According to Shady Business 15, they had no idea who would have wanted to spy on them. They didn't think their parents could be the culprit and described themselves as not being interesting enough to be of interest to police or the government. They eventually decided to place a call to a phone number they located on the SIM card, but only received a message saying, the service is now closed. If you have a voicemail, you can turn it on. They decided to directly contact the manufacturer of the SIM card, but was told they would need a warrant for additional information. Users are still speculating about the origin of the mysterious bug. Jeff the Talking Mongoose, also known as the Dalby Spook, first appeared in 1931. This unusual spirit took up residence with James, Margaret and Voiry Irving on a small farm that they owned in Cashin's Gap near the hamlet of Delby on the Isle of Man. Initially, the spirit seemed to live in the walls of the farmhouse, emitting scratching sounds, squeaks and other animalistic noises, leading the Irvings to believe they had a rodent problem. But as time went on, it was going to become clear that the problem wasn't a rat, but a feisty spirit who apparently took the shape of a mongoose. It wasn't long before the spirit picked up the ability to speak by observing the Irving family. The Irvings began to hear smacking noises along with groans and unintelligible whispers. Eventually, the ghost found his voice and introduced himself, declaring that his name was Jeff and that he was a mongoose that had been brought over from India. Soon, the ghost was stealing food, sleeping in Voiri's room and gathering local gossip about nearby neighbours to report to the family. The Irvings even claimed to have seen the furry spirit, and supposedly Voiri was bitten by Jeff. Jeff's story frequently appeared in local newspapers during the 1930s, and his case was investigated by paranormal researchers. In 1945, Margaret and Voiri sold the farm after James Irving passed away. Leslie Graham purchased the property and laid a claim to have shot and killed a mongoose. This animal was black and white, however, and Voiri stated it wasn't Jeff who was smaller and golden yellow in color. 
No solid explanation has ever been put forth to explain Jeff's existence, leaving the question of who or what Jeff really was unanswered. Now, if you want to see some more unsolved mysteries, then check out these two links right there. Now, in the comments section below, let us know which one of these segments you thought was the weirdest or scariest. We'd love to get your feedback. And that's it for me. I'll see you all next time. Pew!